Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regime Theatre Conf video, let's discuss the Scorpio, shall we, since the internet seems to be doing so at large at this point. This is one of those reveals which, honestly, I think is a record setter in a couple of ways. One, the hype that was leading into the launch is pretty unprecedented, at least in my opinion. And the other one is how it was unveiled in terms of the specifications. Eurogamer got the exclusive to unveil the specs of the system, but not the price, not how the final system looks, and well, even the release date. But I think the fact that they are releasing the details of the specifications so in depth right now is rather telling. The way that this is coming across is that Microsoft wants to allay any fears that the system is not going to be technically capable. For example, it was highly stressed through the interviews that Eurogamer managed to grab that the ESRAM is gone and that the Scorpio was built from the ground up using profiling of the original uh, Xbox One as it was running they could figure out using PIX, which is Performance Investigator for Xbox, how and why the games were slowing down. For example, was it the ESRAM? Was it perhaps CPU bound in one scenario, or GPU bound in another scenario? And then they could basically design a system from the ground up to accommodate much higher resolution textures, higher resolution uh, frame buffers, and of course, higher frame rates. With that said, one concern that people already have online, and this is popping up in forums such as NeoGAF, is of course the CPU. Yes, we still are left with the Jaguar which is much the same configuration as you can imagine. Eight cores, which of course is eight threads, no SMT in this particular CPU, but there are a couple of uh, eyebrow raises. The first of which is we are looking at a design which has a much higher clock speed, 2.3 gigahertz to be precise. And the fact that there is gonna be much lower latency between the CPU and the GPU, much higher memory bandwidth, as well as some additions to the GPU itself, for example, DirectX 12 is now built right onto the GPU block, we'll discuss that in a moment, which does reduce the number of draw calls and processor workload significantly. But I guess let's just start, shall we? Bear in mind there are still a number of questions which the specifications leave. For example, what generation of GPU is inside the Scorpio? With that all said, there are probably going to be some statements from Microsoft over the coming days and quite frankly it's going to take me a couple of days also to go through all of this information and put out a full video. So do think of this as kind of like my preliminary findings. But let's make no mistake about it, the Scorpio is still impressive. The target of 4K above 1080p is a lofty goal. The number of pixels, assuming you're not using t techniques such as checkerboard rendering, um, puts 4K resolution four times the number of pixels above 1080p. This is not merely an incremental step up. So let's also continue discussing the big elephant in the room, simply threatening to trample on your 4K dreams, and that is the CPU. AMD have recently released Ryzen, but despite a few rumors that we might see Ryzen inside the Scorpio, or other reports it would be Jaguar slash Ryzen hybrid, this has just turned out not to be the case. What we have here is a Jaguar processor sporting 31% higher clock speeds than the same CPU found inside the Xbox One or the Xbox One S. The reason behind this is, prim is primarily die size and obviously the other issue, backwards compatibility. We still have two times four uh, modules, so that is two modules times four cores and of course two megabytes of cache per module. Reading a few message boards, it's clear that some people are dubious about Microsoft's decision, and I must admit that I was initially a little disappointed myself, but I am turning more into cautiously optimistic, at least for now. A few changes to Scorpio's architecture have given me some hope, including extensive changes to reduce latency and combine with higher clock frequencies, which in theory will reduce to fewer pipeline stalls. In other words, it will reduce latency and keep the work uh, flowing throughout the system. For example, the GPU won't be starved of data. So if all of the Scorpio, if this is all Scorpio brought to the table, I don't think my doubts would be any less really. But this is combined with multiple other hardware changes. 
For example, the Xbox One audio processors remain intact inside Scorpio, and also with the addition of Spatial uh, Surround and also receiving Dolby Atmos for gaming using HRTF. As a slight side note from what I understand, the audio processing block inside Scorpio remains identical, so the older consoles will also likely benefit from Spatial Surround as well. And this is quite a few CPU cycles um, saved right there. But, while there are some changes regarding, once again, reduction of uh, latency and other bits and pieces, perhaps the biggest change isn't actually from the CPU, it's actually from the GPU. So, one of the things Microsoft have done is push more towards the idea of a heterogeneous architecture. In other words, the GPU and the CPU uh, processing workloads. And one other benefit, a key benefit, is the GPU's command processor, whose job it is to take CPU instructions and then schedule them to work across various GPU shaders. Now we have a DirectX 12 essentially baked right in to this GP. And according to Microsoft, this cuts rendering overheads by half. And in addition, thousands of draw calls, to be cautious, sometimes even hundreds of thousands, can be executed with just nearly 11 CPU instructions, or 9 for, st uh, for GPU state changes. That's a significant improvement, and theoretically, and I once again am remaining cautiously optimistic for now, will mean that the 2.3... Um, gigahertz clock of the Jaguar is almost misleading in terms of its performance, but once again, let's not make some judgments, let's wait further until we get some games. Talking further about the GPU, it does benefit from DCC, known as Delta Color Compression, which in a nutshell shrinks the size of various scene assets such as textures by looking for repeating patterns of color within the scene itself, and this shrinks them so that they can whiz much faster through system buses. It shrinks them, makes them smaller to send, therefore, of course, it can be sent them faster. This is an element sorely missing from the original Xbox One. And regarding the Scorpio's T-flop performance, yeah. Six T-flops. No more, no less. There were two ways Microsoft's team could have gone with increasing the GPU performance. The first is the wider, yet slower approach in terms of core clock, that is 50 or so compute units running at a much lower clock speed. The other approach, the one they ended up going with, is a lower number of um, compute units, but at a much faster clock, and that's what we get. 1172 megahertz and 40 CUs means that the GPU literally just peaks its nose over the 6 T-flop finishing line. This is all combined with doubling the ROPs on the system and adding four times the amount of level 2 cache. What does all of this mean? Well, this allows the triangle and vertex geometry processing rates up by 2.7 times that of the original launch system, as well as pixel fill rates also increased in kind. And in theory, this should allow ample performance to crush 4K titles. Now, this is where I want to provide a slight caveat. Because we don't know a lot of the architecture of the Scorpio's GPU yet, in other words, what version of Polaris it is, I'm sorry, the GCN architecture it is, we are left with some questions regarding um, optimization and how efficient it is. For example, if it is based upon Polaris or Vega, there are inherently some changes we have with those architectures. For example, we have much more efficient ge geometry rendering, it is much better at reducing pixels which are invisible to the scene, and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. We just aren't quite sure where the GCN architecture lies or where the hybrid lines lie, I suppose is the best way of putting it. Now, finally, on the hardware side of things, memory. Yes, is the answer. 12 gigabytes of GDDR5, sir, or madam, running a 384-bit bus clocked at 6.8 gigahertz. Now, let's be honest, no one really doubted that this would be true. It was a leading theory, because the motherboard render was, well, pretty accurate, it turned out, and we kind of guessed it would be fairly within the ballpark. Thus, we're looking at 326 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. This edges out the figure that Microsoft touted originally of 320. Additionally, we see 8 gigabytes of RAM available for games developers. This is up 3 gigabytes from the 5 gigabytes of the original Xbox One. And with the remainder of the RAM, they've increased the OS allocation by 1 gigabyte. Thus, meaning dashboard and other stuff, for example, game DVR, can work in the 4K environment. 
Just for further clarification, if you're wondering, there is no ear SRAM found on the Scorpio engine, also known as the official name for the SOC. It just wasn't needed. They simply map the 32 megabytes of ESRAM to virtual memory to, uh, 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 to the GDDR5. Yes, if you know much about the ESRAM, you'll probably guess that latency is a bit higher. This is, well, one, due to the proximity of the RAM, but there's simply so much overwhelming performance with the Scorpio. For example, pure memory bandwidth and so on. It just wasn't really applicable for older titles, and therefore the impact isn't felt as an overall. Perhaps the interesting thing about all of this is a demo that Eurogamer has shown, and it is running indeed at 60 FPS at 4K. The insane thing, at least in my opinion, is it only took a few days for them to get this running, and the GPU is only hitting about 50 to 70 percent used on the scene. Obviously, this depends on the number of cars or whatever is going on on the track, but there's still plenty of gas, if you'll excuse the poor pun, left in the tank. This means that yes. Scorpio can run many games at native 4K, and in theory, there's wiggle room left over to push high quality texture filtering, lighting, lighting, draw distances, or whatever else developers want to do. There are still a lot of questions to answer, and we'll need to go over more into this in the next few days, but so far our impressions of the hardware are fairly positive. We will continue to delve into Scorpio's hardware, but our early impressions are purely on the hardware announcement side of things, and just in danger of going over old ground a moment once again. Yes, there are still an awful lot of questions remaining. For example, you know, what really are we going to start seeing as a difference between the GPU of the PS4 Pro and the Scorpio when developers really start to push it? And also, I'd really love to know the difference between the PS4 Pro and the Scorpio in terms of the um, I guess the generation of GCN that's being used, like how much Vega is in the PS4 Pro compared to how much Vega is inside the Scorpio, because Mark Cerny did say on stage that they have Polaris plus several generations beyond, which evidently means, in this case, Vega. With that in mind, we more than doubled the power of the GPU and adopted many new features from the AMD Polaris architecture, as well as several even beyond it. So. With all of that said, what are my initial thoughts of the Scorpio? Well, there are several things that we need to take into account. First of all, we do not know the price for the system. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume it's going to be around the 500 US dollar mark, which is quite expensive compared to, let's say, a basic Xbox One S system. But you do get a system which is undoubtedly more powerful than the PS4 Pro. And, well, if you do want to be on the cutting edge of technology, especially if you're a console gamer, and you don't want to jump into PC, this is really the way to go. After all, you're left with a system which is going to be natively capable of playing games like Forza at 4K, and it looks rather spiffy. In fact, as we saw throughout the video, in many cases you're looking at a GPU performance remaining of around 30-ish, 40-ish percent, which is pretty impressive. That means there is still plenty of room left in the Xbox Scorpio's tank. The other question, of course, we can have is, well, what the hell is going to happen with multi-platform games? Okay, we know the Call of Duty, theoretically, the next one is going to look better on the Scorpio, but how much better? Well, that's just a question we're going to have to wait for a couple of months, or maybe even a couple of years to really start knowing until developers can start showing it what the difference between them. Is there going to be a level of parity, or is the Scorpio going to run away? Is it going to be the discrepancy, for example, between the original Xbox One and the PS4? We don't know that yet. And I think the last question in a lot of people's minds is, well, if you're a PC gamer, is this going to be enough to make you jump onto the Scorpio? I have a feeling that if you're a hardcore PC gamer, let's say you have something like a GTX 1080, or perhaps you'll have plans to grab Vega, then there's certainly an argument to still buy Scorpio. One of the compelling reasons naturally being that it could fit in your living room and, well, do pretty much anything. You could run 4K Blu-rays, you can play games, and it's just quite nice. But, on the other hand, as a main machine, well, I think the price is getting worryingly close to a high-end PC. Yes, of course, PCs still cost more money, at least for a high-end one, but you can certainly get a decent PC for around the thousand pound, uh, thousand US dollar mark We'll just have to wait. However, I must say I am relatively impressed with the specifications for now. Unfortunately, 
we are going to have to wait for the complete picture, which I'm assuming is going to be at E3. So it's going to be a very interesting E3, to say the least. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.